who's genuinely won more marketing awards than anybody that I know. So Andy Nair is the co-founder of Lucky Generals, an agency that has a huge reputation in our industry. And that's been shortlisted for Campaigns Agency of the Year for six out of the last seven years. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's an incredible achievement. Um, but in 2021, Campaign named him the top brand strategist in the UK, the third time in the row as well. So look, there's some consistency going on here. Uh, Business Insider also named him one of the top five creative people in the advertising world. Um, not dwelling too much on awards, but he's won 24 IPA effectiveness awards. I mean, gosh, what a record. That's probably uh, probably one of the highest records ever, quite frankly. Um, and interestingly, uh, above and beyond all those accolades, Andy is also now a published author. He's written his first book, uh, Go Luck Yourself, um, where all the royalties are now going to help working class kids get a lucky break into the advertising and creative industry. But above all, just got to say that Andy is also an Edinburgh University grad, um, just like me. So, hey, there we are. I'm really, really privileged to have him on and we can delve into all those various things we've got. So it's such a pleasure to have you on this morning, Andy. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. God, that's a, such a lovely and slightly embarrassing um, introduction. But I should get you to do all my meetings before you know, just do the first few meetings and sort of be my speech man. Amazing. So thank there you. There we are. I can do that. <laughs> Richie, you're the you're the you're the setup guy. But uh, no, yeah. Andy, fabulous to have you on the show. I mean, Jeez. so many accolades, and we'll get into all that. But ju- just for to get us started, where are you, and how are you? What's going on? I'm good. I'm out in um, uh, out near a place called Marlow, which is just outside of. Uh, London. Um, Where I live? You're kidding. You're in Marlow. <laughs> I, I, that's hilarious. Well, I'm out in, I can be even more specific. I mean, I'm in Cookham now. I'll try not to bore everyone with how <laughs> precisely um, you know, where I am, but I'm out in a place called Cookham Dean, which is a nice sort of um, very green place. So, you know, um, over the last couple of years, it's been, you know, while, while we've all had our down moments and our sort of dark times, I, I have to sort of say it's I've, I've often had to tell myself that this is, you know, come on, mate, this is actually, there's a lot worse places to be in, you know, if you're going to be locked away for a couple of years. I tell you what, so, so Cookham, isn't that the home of the CIM as well? It, it also is, that's right, co- coincidentally. Yeah. It's actually a really lovely, huge, big, sort of sprawling facility there. But this is actually the Bucks Massive because we've had Clive Woodward and Will Greenwood uh, and yourself, and I, I'm missing one other as well, who are all sort of Cookham, Marlow. Uh, actually, um, Will Butler Adams lives in Medmanham, but let's not bore everyone with that. So we'll, we'll pick this offline. I've got to now find out exactly where you are, but um, we, we'll do that later on. I think, I guess. Guys, I'm feeling very left out here. So yeah, let's get let's keep let's keep going on track, guys. Um, otherwise, we're going to start getting into what pubs are the best and what restaurants are the best yeah. and stuff. And it's not not a good thing right now. Um, Andy, I want to. I want to pick up really going to the heart of this book because I obviously love the title and I think it plays very much into um, the agency you co-founded as well. But tell us a little bit about the, um, you know, the premise of the book and, and what inspired you to put pen to paper. Well, it really was a product of lockdown. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, as I say, I mean, probably all of us, if we're being honest, we're feeling a little bit miserable and down in the dumps and um, thinking, God, what have we done to, you know, to deserve this so I was you know really started thinking about bad luck really but then a lot of the other big stories of the last few years you know in particular the whole um conversation around diversity and inclusion did really make me think no actually I I have been lucky in so many other ways just because of my demographics um and I did I sort of felt it's got this is a bit embarrassing that luck seems to be this kind of interesting force in life and I know nothing about it even though it's in my agency name because you know we just like the name so I thought that well, that's a bit of a um, that's that's a bit silly. And uh, the more I found out about it, the more fascinating I, I, I thought it is because it turns out to be that a taboo, certainly in Western culture, it's very much of a Western hang up. This, um, you know, we we we've got this absolute uh, denial that there is anything called luck, and I, I think it's really unhelpful because it takes you to a place where you know the only answer to everything is increasingly hard work you know it's you know there's that phrase isn't that that you know there's no such thing as luck the the you know the harder I work the luckier I get um and I get the premise behind that and also you know very importantly I think hard work is incredibly important as is talent but I think to deny that that you know the um existence of things like luck or privilege or all sorts of other things like that is it's just really not very helpful 
So yeah. I thought I'd write a book about it and find a way to how you can actually improve your luck. That's the real premise of the book. That, well, that's what I was going to get to, to hear it and understand that some of it is what comes out of the factory. Uh, and that's the, the luck of privilege. Um, but yeah, I mean, tell us, tell us a bit more about how you make your luck, improve your chances to be lucky. Well, one really simple way, and this is all of this, by the way, is, is sort of rooted in, you know, science and behavioral economics and so on. But one, one of them is to um, just appreciate what you've got, appreciate how lucky you are. And there's lots of research about individuals, how important that is. If you spend a little moment of the day to appreciate the good things in your life, you're more likely to be successful. But I think that's true of organizations. A lot of the time, organizations are sitting on these incredible assets right in front of their noses, and they just don't realize how valuable they are. You know, whether it's an amazing history or they're sitting on tons of data or they've got a great um, you know, provenance story or they've got this incredible owned media, you know, that's as valuable as any, you know, paid for real estate. And, you know, so sometimes the answer is, is so blatantly sitting in front of your nose that you're just over familiar with it. And like lots of things in life, we don't appreciate them. So I think sometimes the role of marketing, you know, and perhaps sometimes external agencies as well, but certainly the marketing function can be to, you know, just help the organization realize, no, wow, this is amazing. This thing that we've got here is really special and we need to make more of it. So, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of lessons around that. Um, there's also quite a lot about um, uh, finding luck in unusual places, you know, so this is why the, the role of, you know, hard work is important, as I keep on saying, but um, sometimes, as we all know, the answer comes to you when you're, going for a walk in a park and you're inspired by nature or you're in an art gallery or you, you're, you you find a connection with football or music or any of these other sort of things in your life. And that's why that's not time wasted. You know, sometimes, you know, finding the cross-pollination of different spheres of your life and having a really rich and diverse life, um, you know, that that can that can increase your chances. It's, you know, it's all statistical, this, isn't it? It's, this is a way of making it more likely to for interesting things to happen. Um, so there's lots of broad things like that. I mean, another one, again, which we might sort of talk about more broadly is, you know, diversity, which, you know, we often approach from a, a very, um, you know, ethical point of view, which is exactly right. You know, it's the right thing to do to have more diverse teams, but it's also just a complete no brainer when it comes to improving your chances of coming up with more interesting ideas, because um, by colliding people's different experiences from different backgrounds, whether that's neurodiversity or, um, you know, race or, um, gender, whatever, whatever that those dimensions are, you're bringing more interesting perspectives to the party, and your ideas are just going to be much better. So, um, yeah, there's lots of big, broad themes like that. Um, uh, maybe we'll pick up on some of them later. But I, I think the the important point is that this is not about superstition. This is, you know, all of this is grounded in hard fact, um, and we can actually take positive steps to, you know, to improve our luck. You know, it's interesting. Your book reminds me of one that I recently read uh, by Shari Cramond, uh, who is the uh, the M&S uh, food director. Um, and she's from Scotland as well. So we're all in good company. Um, and her book was called Win Your Lottery. And it was just uh, another another really insightful sort of tale about how to increase your chances in life. So that there might well be some some uh, some crossovers there. But but Andy, I want to pick up on something that you said, where you talked about that in the Western world, it feels like we're almost in this denial state where the existence of luck exists. And I just want to kind of unpick, why, why is that? Because conceptually, of course, it's true. Mm -hmm. And yet, so why do we live in this world of denial about it? Well, that's a, it's a great question. And I, I found out, and I didn't know this before, but it was it really goes back to Victorian times. So they had um, this belief in you know the, what they call the Protestant work ethic, and they believed that if you were rich and successful, that meant that you had worked really hard and God had smiled on you. And that if you were poor, you just hadn't worked hard enough and it was your own fault. And, and that sort of runs through a lot of Western, you know, culture and business culture, right, you know, right to this current point in time when people are being told the answer to the cost of living crisis is just get another four jobs and work harder and it's sort of your own fault, you know, and this illusion that we've all got equal opportunities and all the rest of it. And so there's a whole bunch of social stuff there that I could get into. But in terms of the workplace, as I say, it's sort of this, it's this delusion, really, that um, it's all down to hard work, you know, that um, just spending an extra three hours at your laptop is going to unlock the challenge. 
when when actually, as as I say, quite often it's put your laptop away, go off and do something else, live a rich and interesting and diverse life, speak to someone else with a different perspective. All all of those things are probably much more likely to get the breakthrough than um, slogging away and telling yourself there's no such thing as you know as as hard work. Um, it's also incredibly selfish, I think. I mean, isn't it? I mean, it's because if you if you sort of um, if you tell yourself there's no such thing as luck, then you're saying that your success is down to your own unique brilliance and hard work. You know, we're the, I'm the one, I've just been harder working than anyone on the planet and I'm just better and cleverer. And you just start to think, well, come on, that can't be right, can it? I agree. That, that's really interesting because you, in the same breath, you talked about, there's a bit about martyrdom in there, um, but there is also a selfishness. Um, and, 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 and it's hugely resonating, um, you know, that comes in unusual places. Uh, like many people, I've, I've been made redundant a few times and it's that sort of forced pivot that at the time feels like, frankly, <laughs> the opposite of good luck. But as it transpires, it does move you on. So, um, I mean, fascinating perspectives. All these perspectives will be built upon your your life's experience. So let's go there a little bit. Um, what, uh, what was your break into the world of marketing and advertising? How did it all begin? Well, I... Um... I really did stumble into it, so it was a lucky break. Uh, I I was doing advert, uh, I was doing uh, law, and I sort of figured out I I enjoyed law, but I didn't want to practice it. Um, uh, I I didn't think it was going to be a creative enough environment, but I did like you know putting a case forward and assembling a story and sort of you know getting all your best evidence together and all the rest of it. And I spoke to a, a very uh, lovely you know, mentor of mine at the time who was a law lecturer. And he said, well, if you like that sort of thing, um, but you want to put that in a more creative perspective, um, you should try advertising. And I, I'd never thought about that as a career before. It seemed like a crazy sort of thing to do. But I, I and I, I didn't do anything about it immediately, but I logged the thought. And, I, you know, the following year, that's what I started applying for lots of ad agencies. And the, the lovely sort of twist of that tale is he then took his own advice. So he was this you know, very successful law lecturer. He was a guy called Alexander McCall Smith. Um, and he's now one of the best selling authors in the world. I mean, he's, um, uh, you know, right up there with J.K. Rowling, frankly. I mean, he's, I think he sold about 70 million books of a, a, a women's detective agency in Botswana. And so I, I think I like to think that I played a part in his success that he thought, well, I'm going to do something more creative with uh, this great brain of mine um, as well. So it just shows that you can make really huge sort of uh, career leaps, can't you? Um, so, I, yeah, I stumbled into it and. I've enjoyed it ever since. So I tell you what, the role of reverse mentoring playing out like you know, <laughs> That's in front right. of your eyes. There yeah. we go. You know, you always like to think that, um, you know, in every relationship, it's always two way and we kind of give and take in that in that context. And you kind of, you know, I, I can see that being true. Um, I also just want to pick up on something you said a little bit before, where it was around the selfishness that you think that actually, you know, you're the product of, of, of your own endeavors, in effect. And actually, you know, when you delve into the histories of some of the most successful people on the planet, it's often what they don't say, um, which is where the delusion kicks in. Because underneath all the very hard work mantras they, they talk about and all the efforts and all the various things, underlying that there always tends to be a huge amount of other things that they don't then attribute to the success mm -hmm. that they have in the first place, whether that be financial backing, whether that be access to networks, whether that be public school um, education, which gets them into um, different areas of life. And so then coming on to that diversity aspect, because it's one of the key things that we do at the School of Marketing. And so the issue then is, is that we then, you know, the, the perception then is everyone attributes this success to hard work, not talking about the other, other foundational elements. But how do we then train the next era of marketers from perhaps more disadvantaged and diverse backgrounds where they don't have those uh, pillars um, that underpin, which perhaps really is the cause of success that nobody talks about? Okay. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, it is the unspoken thing, isn't it? You know, um, and very few people talk about it. Warren Buffett's got a lovely phrase for it. He says he, because he's one of the few people that does acknowledge his luck, even though he's like one of the most successful, you know, people in the planet i guess um and he says he won the ovarian lottery um by being uh which is a great phrase by being a born you know at the in the year that he was born i think it was 1932 he was a white straight able-bodied male 
uh, you know, already he had better chances in life than, you know, 99% of people in history sort of thing. So, uh, and and then, of course, he had to work really, really hard. And then, of course, he has to be really, really smart as well. So he's not saying that he's just locked out sort of thing. Um, I think we, um, for people who haven't had those, um, haven't had every experience, I mean, sometimes it can be helpful to get people to appreciate the, the things that they are, uh, you know, that, that might at first sight feel like a, a disadvantage and in certain cases might certainly provide you know lots of obstacles in life can actually be the thing also that you know, as Mark's point it can it can turn out to be the thing that um gives them a different perspective um on life I was speaking to a, a strategist the other day who has Asperger's and was we were having a bit of a conversation about how that had presented him with some challenges and then anyway we were just talking about his is is he showed me some some slides and he he had written the best decks I've ever seen that were the, the the storytelling and the visual brilliance of the decks was so incredible and unique and I really hadn't seen anything like it before and and I you know we were sort of just talking about that they, that is your strength yes it might have some some challenges as well sort of thing um but that's largely society's problem frankly that they haven't really sort of um uh, you know, create an environment where you can sort of show your talents off to the best in the best light. So I think some there is this classic thing. Some of the things that we think are um, problems about ourselves are sometimes other people's problems, and actually they could be our killer. You know, our sort of dynamite sort of qualities, sort of thing. So just trying to have, trying to get people to think positively about some of this sort of stuff is is really helpful. Yeah, and you mentioned um, Asperger's. Uh, we've had a few guests who talks specifically to how neurodiversity has been their secret source, really. Actually, Jeremy Connell Waite, in particular at IBM, um, brilliant speechwriter, and he visualises and illustrates and deconstructs some of the great speeches, and he fully acknowledges it. It's his ADHD which enables him to do that. Um, fascinating. Now, you made me chuckle, because uh, when you said Dex, mm. then there's the brand strategist coming okay. through. Uh, brand, brand strategist of the year three times so you know your way around a deck uh, and you talked about assembling a story I think in, in terms of the, what you learned from law now it's probably really obvious to you the link between how you assemble an argument in law and how that relates to brand strategy um, but I'd love you to unpick that a little bit because there's probably some golden nuggets in there for many people just about you know kind of what your line of logic is in assembling a story okay well um I think, first of all, the importance is because, you know, there's got to be substance to it. So you can't, I think we all know, you can't uh, take something terrible and then spin it into a sort of, uh, into something wonderful. It's, a story is much better if it's based on some sort of uh, truth. Um, but having said that, then packaging really is important, isn't it? And that's, you know, there's a great irony that advertising and marketing sometimes don't market themselves as well in the world or in, within our companies as we as we should do so so i think really it's a lot of the times about simplification and it is about learning from those great um the really great storytellers there's some a great set of uh rules that pixar um i don't know if you've ever seen these that, that they they have published their sort of guidelines for aspiring sort of script writers and they're absolutely brilliant and 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 uh you know, I would definitely recommend somebody digging them out to have a little look at and using in presentations. Um, but I've, my, if I had a top tip, one of the one of the things I've um, learned over the years is um, often we 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 present our strategies as very linear affairs. So we 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 start with the you know here's the business objective and then here's the you know the marketing objective and here's the comms objective and here's and we go through all the different steps in the logic that um, we have perhaps developed them, but. Actually, what you need to do is think about, you know, forget how you got to the idea and package it in the way that's going to be most interesting to the audience that you're trying to persuade. And so one of the things I've learned over the years is sometimes you start at the start with the, um, you know, start at the end almost. Um, it's like what a lot of good movies do, don't they? They, they? they start with a, you know, there's a body, you know, and at the beginning of the film is you're right in the middle of the action or there's a car chase or, you know, they don't they don't give you all the lead up to it. They, you know, they start with the action and then they unwind and tell you what the um you know the story was how they got there and I think you know we've all been sitting in those presentations before on the other end of it and we're waiting for what the heck, when the hell are they going to get to the point sometimes it's better to start off with your big theme and say this is this this meeting today is going to be all about this idea you know um or you know it's going to be about this insight 
and, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute, but I just want to dwell on this for a moment. And then you've got everyone excited and interested, and then you can go back through all the... So it's simple little techniques like that, I, I find can be really helpful. That's, re that's really insightful. And, and, I, and I totally relate to that, um, especially having sat in loads of those presentations before. Um, Andy, I wanted to, to pick up on Lucky Generals because... It's, it's an agency that's synonymous in the industry, right? It's almost like it's, it's just always been there, but clearly it hasn't always been there. It was founded, it was created. And so not only are you a business owner, but you clearly are an entrepreneur as well at heart. So what made you do this? What, what made you get in? And perhaps what have been some of the trials and tribulations along the way? Um, well, it's about, thank you very much for that. That's very kind of you. It's, it's, um, it's about nine years old ago. So I'm trying to remember, how did we do this? Um, I mean, I, it, the, the real story is that I've, um, I am very lucky to use that word again, to work with two very good friends. You know, we'd worked together for a long time. Helen Calcraft, I, I probably worked with for about 25 years now, you know, nonstop. So we can certainly finish each other's sentences off. Uh, and then Danny Brooke Taylor worked with for about 15 years. So we were working together at pre a previous agency that was also very successful called MCBG. Um, and then we made a mistake. So talking about learning from mistakes, we were having a great old time, three friends having a lovely old time. And we, we'd we sold various chunks of the, we're selling the agency off in, in, in parts. And then right at the end of it, when we could have sold off the final um, you know, stake and gone on, do, done whatever, um, we decided to do a merger. And so this was all our own fault. I'm not blaming anyone else for this. Was our, and on paper, like a lot of mergers, uh, it made absolute sense because we had a very successful agency, creative agency, and then we merged with what was at the time the digital agency of the decade. So, and it was at that time, 10 years ago, um, probably about, actually it was probably about 12 years ago now, um, where that seemed to make eminent sense. And they're right up in campaign and everyone was sort of saying, this is brilliant, this is the future. And it just wasn't through nobody's fault. In fact, if anything, everyone was a little bit too nice. There, was, there wasn't there was enough clarity in the merger, you know, so everyone was just being terribly nice. And I think with what I did learn out of that is that a merger needs to have some absolute, you know, even if it's slightly ruthless clarity about who's doing what sort of thing. Um, but anyway, the point is we really didn't like it. it. It was it was the first time in our careers, really, that we didn't have fun. We weren't fulfilled um, and we felt a bit miserable. But uh, in retrospect, what that did was give us a brilliant idea of what we did want to do. And that was to set up the three of us together and create the sort of work that did make us excited. And so what was a miserable time at the moment, we now have long forgotten about. And it turned, it really did turn out to be the thing that provoked us to start Lucky Generals. So um, that's a, there's another sort of lesson in that, I think. Uh, yes, another example where you need to go through the lows to get to the highs. And so many of our guests have talked about that the moments of failure have as what led has led to the dot 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 directly linked to what has led to their success um just in terms of lucky generals nine years i mean nine golden years hmm. um what, what's what's some of the best stuff that's happened in those nine years um i mean really the overview is just you know watching people develop you know it starts off with three people and now it's you know whatever it is a hundred and something and and just watching, you know, some people who've joined us straight from college and never worked anywhere else and developed alongside us and grown. And it's, it's just been so rewarding. Um, and then working long term with clients has been a lovely thing as well. You know, I think um, in today's world, a lot of client relationships with agencies are very, very short, aren't they? And we've, we always set out, you know, partly, as I say, because of our last experience, we thought we only want to work on, you know, businesses where we really like the people and we want to work long with, you know, we don't, we don't want a huge client list. We'll just let, work with a fewer people for longer and deeper. And so when we look, when I look at, you know, Amazon, which we have worked with almost from the beginning and just got bigger and bigger projects and Super Bowl was, a, you know, a huge um, thing for us. But that was the culmination of a very long process of working together on, um, you know, small product briefs in the UK um, you know, and, and now doing global campaigns for them every year for the holidays. And, you know, we've done our fourth Super Bowl campaign and all that kind of, sort of stuff. But they, that's a combination of very long term, deep, trusting you know, relationships. And, you know, I, I think that's the mark of all all of our client relationships, really. It's this kind of personal connection um, with people like Yorkshire Tea and the co-op and so on. 
just to come in there, um, Jerry Maguire, one of my favorite films. Sounds sounds a bit like that, like fewer, bigger, better. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. I, I mean, I, people, it's incredible the amount of, and we we know why this happens, but you know, some agencies you know pitching for dozens of things or even like thirty or forty things a year, and I just don't know how you do that justice. Or maybe it's just us anyway. But we what we what we decided because of that previous experience, we said we're only gonna we're gonna play to our strengths. We're gonna do what we enjoy. We're not going to try to be anyone else, and if it might, it might, this might not work for other people. Maybe other agencies do need, you know, huge numbers of clients and you know all that kind of stuff. But it's it's just been much better for us to to concentrate. I think, um, and then you get to know people, and then and then again, if their times are hard, you know, or if you go through bumps and you you know something doesn't work out for you, then they're more forgiving and trusting, and because we know that. Um, we're all in it together and we're trying to help each other out so um, yeah that's that's what's built this place it's not just been the three of us it's been a lot of other people. I think it's um, you know your perspective there has probably come across come to after perhaps years and years of experience where you sort of just got to the realization there's, there's an underlying confidence there that not yeah. confidence in an arrogant way in a comfort that actually you yeah. guys are just going to be you and it, you know yeah. not chasing um, all the big jazzy lights, um, as as many do, it's kind of like no, we're gonna like literally get down to it and 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 quality over quantity, which I think it's is definitely. It's also just sort of um, you know, uh, I'm probably presenting this as as if it's terribly high minded and moral and all the rest of it, and you know, maybe there's a wee a wee bit of that, but it's also just like um, blatant common sense because what when whenever we have strayed from our principles and tried to pitch for things that we didn't really have such huge enthusiasm for we've always lost i think we're not good at so we, we probably show our lack of enthusiasm when we're going through the motions to you know let's get that big global account that we don't particularly like but it's you know going to be worth a lot of money we're terrible at it so why <laughs> put yourself through the you know that um the pain of a pitch when you're better just to sort of you genuinely be able to say to people oh we love this brand or we love this challenge we love you um and the other thing i would say is that we've the big learning for us and when when we started we, we set out you've got to write these terrible you know positions for what your own company is going to be about which is you know the the worst brief in any agency but ours was to be a, um, a creative company for people on a mission and the people bit was really important because what we've learned again like you say perhaps over experience is that don't get seduced by a brand or a company name that you think, oh, that that would be cool. Because there have been so many times in our careers where just a person rocks up at a company and wants to change things or change the world. And that, we'd much rather work with people like that than somewhere, a, a really cool, amazing brand that we've all heard of that's done great work. But, you know, the culture's not right. So it, it, we've, we've picked up these amazing personal relationships with people who want to do great stuff for including for some brands that you know in some cases we've not really heard of before or we certainly wouldn't have thought we're going to be you know the next big thing so um yeah yeah um i think you said four super bowl ads that caught my ear uh love to know about what sort of buzz and merry-go-round happens around super bowl advertising uh well it's uh it is it's an incredible thing because of course it is the biggest event in the american you know cal- advertising calendar um and we've been doing them all we have got now an, an office in new york but really we've done them all from our little office in exit market so it's slightly ridiculous that we've ended up you know straying into this uh you know po- the heartland of american culture but um as i say we'd we'd worked our way up through various briefs on amazon and then this brief came along. We we pitched for everything. Um, I mean, we it, it it's a project based relationship that's lasted eight years, and that's kept us on our toes. And um, you know, there's no complacency on our part. So we 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 you know they've got great agencies that they can speak to all over the world. Um, and we we first made the breakthrough with an ad where uh, we were trying to promote Alexa to the world. And it was if you have to you have to take your mind back a little bit now. This is five years ago when I guess Alexa's position as the unrivaled sort of you know the almost the 
being synonymous with voice technology it was not quite there yet there was a there was more competition you know google there was there was more of a technology race beginning it was google um you know microsoft apple you know all, all the big players you know um and so the brief was how do we how do we establish that leadership but also how do we make that brand have a bit of humanity because the problem with all these big tech brands now is that you respect them and sort of you know realize that the technology works but you don't particularly like them very much that they can feel cold and techy um so we thought let's let's bring some humanity to alexa um and then the breakthrough of the very first ad was one of these lovely serendipitous conversations where um our creative director danny was talking to somebody who's not even in the creative department is an operations guy called Nick Upton. And he had been talking about um, one of his kids and watching this video, um, The Little Mermaid, you know, the, the Disney film, um, and sort of uh, where, where The Little Mermaid loses her voice. And, and he was sort of saying, wouldn't it be funny if um, if Alexa lost her voice? That might be quite an interesting way to to show how human she um, she might be. You just triggered my. Oh, really? Am I switching? That's right. Sorry, <laughs> that's probably going to cause chaos now. Uh, I'll, I'll say the A word rather than sort of it's going to oh, yeah. wreck this thing. Um, so, so what was what was uh, funny was um, this idea, and and it sounds like you know I'm positioning it like I know it would be funny, but no, it was, there was actually a really sort of important sort of um, thought behind this, which was. Uh, how do you show humility or self-deprecation? You know, sometimes the biggest company in the world to take this, the biggest moment in the world of advertising and to, um, and to frankly, almost show your product not working was a, it was a pretty huge and brave mm. step for them to embrace, but they really did get behind it. You know, Jeff Bezos is in the ad um, wondering how is this even happening? How is this possible as his aides kind of, you know, enlist lots of celebrities to try and help them. Yeah. Um, we actually did work with their engineers to to make it um, so that if you did ask how, uh, you know, who's going to win the Super Bowl in the run up to the the final, um, Alexa would cough, and um, you know, th there was a little Easter egg in there that millions of people sort of had been exposed to before the final, um, uh, and so that created a lot of buzz and social. What's going on here? What's you know, wh why is it not working? Sort of thing. And so it was a really integrated, although it was a huge big blockbuster telly ad with lots of celebrities, there was a lot of other social media and technology and PR thinking built into it. Um, and it and it won the Super Bowl. You'd have this huge vote where millions of people vote for the best ad. And, and that was the first and only time a British agency has has won the a popular vote for the best Super Bowl. So um, and then we've gone on, I think we've always been in the top three um since then. Um so it's a it's a lovely thing to work on, and because it's all about populism, it's about how do you do something that the vast swathes of American public are gonna uh, really love, uh, and they've always had that self deprecating. That's been the common theme. We've always had a little bit of a laugh at you know uh, the silly world of tech, um, and it makes people feel a little bit closer to Alexa and to Amazon as a result. I think, by the way, that's such a great psychological advertising nugget there in itself. Um, when, when thinking about advertising and how to be effective. Um, you know, it's funny, Andy, as you were speaking that, I, I, you know, literally recall that advert straight back in my mind and the penny dropped and it's almost like talking to the, the, the creating team behind it. It's just incredible to, to get that opportunity, get this opportunity to do that. You've talked about an example of, of probably one of the high moments in the agency. Have there been any low and what have you learned from them? Oh, lows. Um... Well, yeah, obviously, um, the 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 pandemic came as a sort of uh, um, uh, a little surprise, let's say, for for all of us. Um, and um, you know, that's again the you know the 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 initial you know worries that we all had were for our people and for our clients, and you know, but the, for the first time, really, we were thinking about you know literally matters of life and death, weren't we? And we were sort of um, it was it was just such a crazy uh you know um jump into this unknown world where we were you know we just couldn't possibly imagine that and I think that's where you know what did we learn from it I guess we were we were fortunate you know again in the sense that we if you built good foundations I think the businesses that thrived or this that survived it better were were those that already had better foundations in place you know they had a strong culture um you know the fundamentals were there um, 
However, you know, still there are aspects of it that were you just couldn't do anything about, it. and you just had to, you know, we had we had just won a, a large cruise line in Miami um, beforehand and opened up an office in New York on the back of it at great expense. That was quite an interesting, um, you know, little uh, challenge to have because we we now had this office in uh, on the uh, Fifth Avenue and a, and a cruise client that wasn't going to be spending any money for the next couple of years. So um, you just have to pull your socks up and. Um, you know, hustle a bit and uh, use the, you know, use the goodwill and other things that you built up over the years to sort of get through those um, times. So that that is probably unoriginally that, you know, because it's probably the worst thing that's ever happened to any of us in the in, in the business world. Um, that was probably the lowest point. Um, and, you know, there probably been other little bumps along the way. We Like anyone else, we've lost clients, we've lost pitches. But we, and again, I guess this is our main you know, approach to life, we don't tend to dwell on them too much. You know, we move on. Sometimes you can't like, you know, sometimes we beat ourselves up to learn, you know, why did we not win that thing? And sometimes you just have to accept that somebody beat you on the day or you weren't right for each other. Or, you know, if you interrogate too much, you can, um, you can overthink things and sort of try and change yourself in a way that's not helpful, I think. Can I just have a quick, quick follow up there? Um, are there any coping mechanisms um, in those moments that you kind of turn to? So, you know, yes, I philosophically don't dwell. Are there any other things that kind of help you to kind of just get back up and and move forward? Um, I think it's that classic um, advice to kids, isn't it? Get back in the saddle and um, you're always best if you've got another another challenge coming up where you can do your stuff Um you know, if obviously if you've if you've established a sort of a an area that really needs addressing, that you know, you've got a failure in some you know way, then you need to sort of lean into that and accept it and you know, and do something about it. Um, but um, don't don't spoil the secret sauce in the process, if you know what I mean. Yep. You know, there, there does come a point where you can sort of you're always course correcting and reacting to things that have not gone right. And then you, you end up very far away from what is your sweet spot and what you're very sort of, um, what you're very good at. Um, there's, um, there's a strong sense of karma about you, Andy. Um, and, and I was going to ask, you know, well, what really gets you riled or upset or, but I, I it's more going to be, um, yeah, has has that come through time? Have you matured into that? Do you think that's how you came out of the factory? Um, wh- where where does the the karma come from? Ooh, I think it probably it probably has developed over the years because you get you you witness things. I think perhaps when you start off, or maybe I probably was more, you know, you would take things to heart. I mean, I can remember a couple of pictures at my first agency when we didn't get them. I was absolutely like properly distraught I mean in tears I think at one one point on on one of them and it's taking everything incredibly personal and because you just can't conceive of it's a funny thing isn't it as I can see when you've worked on something so long you can't conceive of any other possible answer and you think yours is the only and then actually you sort of get over yourself a little bit and realize no actually there are quite a lot of other very clever people in this business that can easily come up with something better or just different and it's a subjective thing and it doesn't mean you know that the rejection that you, that you do get a lot in our industry don't you because you're constantly presenting yourself and putting yourself on the line and associating yourself with an idea and people turn them down a lot of the time and you just have to um not take it personally i think is the the thing that i've learned um Obviously, if you're always failing, then that's maybe a different a different thing. But if it's, you know, you, you need, and you do, you go through those stretches, don't you? I mean, you, uh, we, I certainly have, and we have, where we, and the, so again, lockdown, we we really had a, within that whole lockdown problem, we, we had a, a bit of a stretch where we were terrible at new business because we didn't quite adjust. We hadn't quite, um, a lot of our appeal, I think, is when you, it sounds ridiculous, but when you're in the room with us and it's and there's a physical setting and a physical connection, because if you think about it, you know, the, the three of us are so, not that we're in every meeting, but because we've got very strong chemistry built up over the years and because our agency is in a physical place that you can really feel that it's a different sort of agency, um, that was all stripped away when we were on um, on a Zoom 
call because it's just three you know boxes on a on a screen and you could say that everyone everyone's in the same boat but but I think that sort of disproportionately affected us because we um we weren't able to sort of play up some of those things that make us special we were all reduced to we were no different from the huge multinational agency you know where you walk into their reception you think oh this is a bit sort of corporate you couldn't get that mm, this is a bit corporate neither could you get when you walk in our place oh this is buzzy and independent and interesting um and so i think we we lost out a little bit um we had we had this thing we, where we talk over each other a lot in our meetings because just because we know each other very well and on Zoom, that doesn't really work. And people would always be sort of saying, you know, oh, Danny, what was that you just said about Andy? And it would be some throwaway comment that, he, you know, and then when you have to repeat it, it's that horrible thing. You're repeating a joke that really was just a throwaway comment. And it was a bit cringy. So anyway, we, after after a while, we just worked out, you know, we're trying to, we need to do them in a different way. You can't just do these meetings in the same way that we do when we're on the office. You have to find a different way. And then everything clicked into gear after that. I, I think that's actually really insightful, by the way, uh, in, you know, in the sense that actually there has to be a different way in the virtual world versus yeah. the physical one. And, and, and obviously, we're all meddling through that at the moment. I want to pick up on um, a point that you, you raised earlier, um, both about mentoring and then perhaps reverse mentoring in some ways. What, what role has mentoring played in your life, um, either as a mentor or as a mentee? Um, and what do you think, you know, is, is it an important component of, of development? such a huge part isn't it um i mean I, i've been lucky to have some amazing mentors really over my um life uh you know sort of pick a few I, when i started off i started off an agency called abbott mead vickers who we all know is like you know, you know one of the biggest um and i had this amazing woman called uh, mia kennedy who took me under wing and just you know at that beginning and really so much is picked up by osmosis so i just watched her in action and i, I must have I mean, God, I don't know how she put up with me because I'm sort of be trailing around her in every meeting. I mean, I really did properly shadow her. And um, but just by watching how brilliant she was, I picked up so much stuff. And she was very generous with the time and patient. And and you're learning at that stage, I think, very specific skills. You know, you're learning how do I commission and conduct research and how do I write a brief and how do I. So there's a lot of just quite practical things. Um, and then I moved to a place called Rainy. Well, it was called Rainy Kelly, Campbell Roth back then, and it's now um, you know gone through a few name changes, VML or Y and R. Um, and the, but the founder of that was an amazing woman called um, M T Rainy, and she was a very different sort of planner. She had she was she was very um, she, she was a very creative strategist, um, and and really sort of believed that the that the strategy itself should be an idea. And I picked up a lot of you know just quite interesting sort of uh, thinking. Um, from her uh, and she was doing just incredibly inspirational and I, I feel a lot of my planning style has has been a pale imitation of trying to sort of, sort of copy her so that was great so you so you pick up different at different stages of queue you're learning different things um, and then and then it's nice when you sort of learn a few things yourself that you can start to mentor other people and you get such a reward from seeing them learn and develop um, because I guess as you I know you're great champions of this and it's one of the uh, the most amazing things that you guys do but the good mentoring is in short supply isn't it but it makes a big difference to people's lives really you can you can actually tell the and, and that is when 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 somebody sort of says that made I, I was listening to a podcast recently and a, a, a woman I'd I'd mentored 20 years ago I went to the states for a couple of years and she's now become really successful and I, I saw her, she's in a podcast I'll, I'll find out about what she's up to now I've, not, I've lost contact and she gave me a little name check in this um, podcast and it was honestly the nicest thing I think that happened to me all year last year and we got back in touch and sort of re-communicated and you know she was this Asian American uh woman and kind of just saying that this is 20 years ago she didn't feel quite right in the you know, I just it was just a lovely thing to sort of um uh you know feeling it now as I, as I think about it but it's just a lovely thing to feel that you have played a very tiny part in in somebody's you know in releasing somebody's talent basically that uh, I'm feeling it as well. Uh, I mean, you brought to life very, very vividly the how rewarding mentoring can be in mm. in all directions. Um, just on AMV, we had Silla Snowball on the show, on oh. the show uh, last week. And what, what a, sorry, Dane Silla Snowball. Uh, yes. What what a joy um, it was to, to have Silla. Lovely, uh, lovely person. Yeah, very lovely, wonderful. Now, now, 
we've overshot a little bit. We've 40 minutes odd has gone in an absolute flash. So we are right. coming to the end. So um, the, the final question, you, you've already given us a couple of things, but I'm going to ask you, you you've said don't don't dwell get back in the saddle a few other bits and pieces in terms of tips and tricks but what, what would your advice be to people trying to get into the marketing and advertising industry at the beginning you know in the foothills of what will be glorious careers what, what would your advice be well, I, i'm going to borrow some advice from dolly parton of all people um because she has got this great mantra uh, which is find out who you are and then do it on purpose and what she means is, you know, uh, guess what I've said before, find out what your secret sauce is and then actually accentuate it and play it up. In her, her case, she figured out early on in life that she had this sort of stereotype. She, she was a, seen as the hillbilly and the buxom blonde and all the rest of it. And rather than downplay her sort of very humble origins, she's played them up. She's she, she's written all the best jokes about Dolly Parton are written by Dolly Parton. Um, and she's just become this hyper... She just exploited all her sort of strengths and taken some of the things that other people might have thought as weaknesses. And she's she's been obviously phenomenally successful in so many different fields. And I think that's a lesson for us. And a lot of people try and be someone else and you're better to just find out what is really great about you and then and then really accentuate it and do it, you know, do it deliberately, um, do it on purpose. So that would be my advice. I think I like like a lot of us. I certainly spent my first few years trying to be someone else and trying to do you know other things that you know uh, just didn't suit me and 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 I, I was much better when I stopped doing that. It's it's interesting, you know the the fact that you've had the twists and turns, but it feels like directionally now, you know, like you say, you've you've got to a, a place where you know what you who you are, what you're good at, and you and you steer in that direction. It's it's. It's great. So thank you, Andy. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you thank on this you. morning. It's been such a super insightful session. This is the the part where, where me and Mark try and do a few key takeaways and try and do you justice of what we've heard. Um, so I'll, I'll start off and then Mark, maybe perhaps if you tail behind. But um, I mean, first of all, I mean, clearly the book, congratulations, Lockdown Love, as, mm -hmm. as you call that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think demystifying the role of luck is something that's really important and and perhaps as you say underplayed in in our context here today so i think that's you know something that uh, people will take great comfort from so everybody please buy the book there we go great plug um as it were um but also some of those anecdotes you know appreciate how lucky you are finding luck in unusual places give yourself that break you don't have to be that that's, you know, that person who sits by the laptop the whole time, you know, in fact, actually you're doing yourself a disservice by doing that um, in, in that sense. We talked about um, stories, whether that be your, your legal trials and tribulations into and how you got into the world of advertising um, around the, the thought around the great mentor that you had, who now has gone on to be as famous as J.K. Rowling. Uh, as many books sold. So he, you know, the, the role, the role of reverse mentoring is here and live and kicking. Um, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the stories around storytelling that you, you mentioned on the techniques around storytelling start um, at the end is an, it's a lovely technique there. Um, even the personal stories around the hardships of, of your career journey, you know, um, sort of high, the, the lows of the merger um, into the highs of what then, what then came on to be lucky generals and how that came to, um, so look, I'll, I'll stop on that on that note, but it's just an amazing, amazing journey that you've been on. And I feel really privileged to have, to have had the opportunity to speak to you this morning. So thank you. Oh, thank you. A lovely summer. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just, to, just to come in, I, I think Richie did a fairly bang up job there, uh, but a couple of more things. Um, I won't talk to luck because you mentioned that, although I did love the Avarian Lottery reference to Warren Buffett. And, you know, I would put myself in, in that bucket as well in terms of privilege. Um, I, I, I really liked the fewer, bigger, better thought. Um, the, the, my, for me, the, the Jerry Maguire reference, and it mm -hmm. it opened the arc of the interview into a space of I would describe as quite high karma, uh, and um, you know, you just you do come across in a very uh, karmic way, if that's the word. Um, but but then again, uh, you know, you, the fact that you're fairly open and frank about the times that haven't been so brilliant even to the point of being in tears at losing a, a pitch. Um, I, I loved the fact that Little Mermaid losing her voice coming from a production or operational or technical person could be a source of inspiration. It just goes to show that creativity is around us 
everywhere. Uh, the, the role that mentoring played that moment 20 years on, you know, that's that's really quite touching. Um, but I, th- I think probably the, my biggest thing is it's about what's your own personal secret sauce. Um, may take time to find and nurture, but it does sort of run all the way through the interview. Um, and as Richie said, you, you, you know what your secret sauce is. And I think we could probably all learn from that, including myself and Richie. So it's been a, a real treat to have you on, Andy. And thank you for your time and energy and insight. Huge, huge thank you to 